Hi. Um, so I'm one part of DIYability here with John Schimmel. And really what DIYability is, is an accessible makerspace. But before we really get into that, um, to introduce myself, I am an occupational therapist by trade. I work in the field of assistive technology. So I work with adults and children with physical and cognitive impairments using technology and changing the way they interface and interact with technology to help facilitate independence and whatever they want to be. Um, I do that at NYU Medical Center as well as we work with DIY, I work with DIY Ability and I'm also an adjunct professor at NYU in their occupational therapy department in the School of Steinhardt. And yeah, I'm, I'm John Schimmel. Um, I don't have much on there. Holly's got a lot of acronyms for her <laughs> titles. Uh, I, I, am a, I pay my bills as a programmer, but I also am a, a tinkerer and um, I'm passionate about assistive technology and getting people with disabilities, and you'll hear all that tonight. Um, Holly and I met at ITP. Uh, I taught uh, assistive technology classes there and some web development classes there. Um, but yeah, DIY ability, empowering people with and without disabilities um, to make their world. So um, much like IDX, uh, IT, does, you guys know of ITP over at NYU? So uh, ITP is the Interactive Telecommunications Program. It was started by this uh, wonderful woman, Red Burns. Um, Red uh, kind of started in 1979, I think, 78 or 79. And um, it was just a space that grew like when the Sony Betacam came out and they wanted to give artists portable video cameras. Um, and then it grew into programming and electronics and design and video and everything else that's there. Um, Holly and I met at a, a developing assistive technology class there. And uh, it was a mashup between the occupational therapy department and the ITP students. Um, it, was, it was someone like Red, though, that would cut through the bureaucracy of NYU um, to actually let two schools work together on one class. Apparently, the computer systems don't do that. <laughs> And so they each had to under-register a class, which is like not allowed, but Red made it happen. That's, you know, that's the long story of it. And really what was great about that class um, is it brought together engineers and makers and these alternative thinkers. And then you have the OTs, and we're so analytical and kind of we do everything by the book. And so you had this, but we had a different look at the way you interact with the people and people with disability. And so you had all these different mindsets working together to come up with solutions. Um, for, typically with technology or with design to help facilitate independence. So as a group, the OTs were becoming affected and changing their thinking and what they were learning from the makers. And then the makers were learning so much about disability from the OTs. So it really was such a great collaborative class. Right. And we'll talk about like it's a design challenge every time. It's like if you're working for a specific person, not maybe a specific uh, situation, uh, the person might have a completely one-off case. And you might build that thing once, which is a really unique some people might, I, I enjoy those kinds of projects because you don't have to think about every situation. You can think about just the situation you're working on. Um, and so uh, DIY Ability started, Holly and I were, uh, while I was teaching assistive technology classes, I would bring my classes over to see Holly's uh, uh, clinic at NYU Medical. And um, eventually we had worked with a, uh, um, a patient Mm -hmm. to make a, a video game controller, which we'll talk about later. Um, but from this patient, we kind of figured out that we should be actually, maybe not be teaching the grad students at IGP about uh, making assistive technology, but actually getting people with disabilities and their family members and their caregivers also thinking about making technology. Because um, it's always nice for us to build things for them, but then the semester ends, and you, what do you do with your project? And so that's a, we ran into that a lot when I was teaching the class at NYU. So DIY ability is just kind of just thinking like, well, maybe we're teaching the wrong people. So um, assistive technology, uh, world opening. We'll talk about this a lot. Um, and then the maker mindset, maker fair was this weekend. Uh, everyone's probably played with Arduinos here, um, processing and um, all those other things. So your world. yes. <laughs> So when you think about individuals with disabilities, um, they want to be independent. They want to do a lot of things for themselves. And even just being employment, trying to find gainful employment is so challenging for them. You know, you, I, I work with individuals all the time that could absolutely work if they had the right setup or if they had more open-minded 
employers or what people see when they, you know, you have someone with a wheelchair come into the door and already people are thinking all the things they probably can't do. And so 79% of people with disabilities are unemployed, which is clearly a very huge number. And what can we do to help them? Um, Abilities Long Island, you want to go into this? Oh, yeah. Bit? yeah. So there was this uh, pretty amazing guy, Henry Viscardi, in Long Island. Um, does anyone know the Viscardi School or the Vis Viscardi Center? It's called the Abilities School now. Um, so Henry Viscardi uh, was born without legs. He got some prosthetics. He started getting jobs and started getting, one of his jobs was to get people with disabilities also getting jobs. Um, he ended up making this company called Abilities, and one of their, 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 their uh, motto was, uh, you know, uh, they don't want to seek opportunity in charity. They want the security of being able to do something for themselves. Um, so this factory was kind of contracting for the aviation and the electronic industry on Long Island uh, in the 50s. And they had about 170 employees. Pretty much everyone had a disability out there. Um, the joke was when they started the company, there was um, four, <laughs> it was four men that started the company, and they had uh, one good arm and two good legs among them. Um, <laughs> So he wrote this book called Give Us the Tools, which is an amazing book if you ever have to find an old book on eBay. Um, but it talks about the story of basically uh, how they built it as a company. Um, but a lot of what we're going to talk about today is kind of like uh, the tooling. Uh, indirectly, we'll talk about the tooling, making the tools so people can uh, make their world. Um, some photographs from his lab, or his, uh, their, uh, their uh, I guess, their uh, factory. Um, but uh, you can see in the lower left corner, uh, there is a photo of an electronics. Um, basically, these people, some of them were blind, some of them were you know, uh, deaf, uh, physical impairments, um, a whole gamut of uh, situations. Um, and basically, there's one or two people that went around the factory and made jigs um, or did the, uh, the, the mentoring so they could each learn how to do the, the task that they had to do that week or for that project. Um, and so uh, it was all about making the job fit the person. And so it's that about if we can find the right technology to fit them, then we can help them find employment. Then we can help them be more independent. It could really be anything. It could be anywhere from controlling their TV remote to turning a light on and off to finding that gainful employment. employment. And that's where computers come in as a great equalizers. If somebody can access a computer, they can send an email, they can go on Facebook, they can control their environment, they can find a job. Um, and we're looking at how can we adapt that environment? How can we change the way they're interfacing with their computer? How are we changing the way they're using their tablets, their smartphones, to be able to gain some independence? And so nowadays, you can use a computer to control a 3D printer, a laser cutter. Um, anything in the home. I mean, back in the day, you know, I've been an occupational therapist for over 20 years, and I've been doing technology for the majority of that, maybe the first year or two I really didn't. And if I had somebody who came into the clinic who was spinal cord injured, and let's say they were a high-level quadriplegic so that they could only move their head, if they wanted to control the lights in their house, it would be this $12,000 wonky setup that I'd have to get somebody to come in, hardwire stuff behind the walls, and then it wouldn't work half the time. And it would be frustrating, and it would be way expensive, and nobody could afford it because these are not things insurance companies are going to cover. Nowadays, with the accessibility you have in a smartphone, I can set that up with a Bluetooth interface, put a switch by their head, get a couple smart plugs around the house, and for maybe $1,000, we're controlling everything. And so you can, and it's, in, it's with them all the time. I can easily just put that little switch on a little lock line mount, and it's done. And now they're completely independent with controlling their own home. And there's so many quality of life issues that come up with that. If you think about, if you had to ask whomever you lived with every single time you want to change a channel on your TV, or every time you wanted to turn the light on and off, how would that make you feel? I have a ton of patients that sit at home with the door unlocked because they can't lock and unlock the door, but they have aides coming in and out, and the aides need to get in and out. But not everybody lives in the best neighborhood, and even if you do, it's still unsafe. And that's what they're doing all day long, is they're uncomfortable in their own home because the door is unlocked. You put a smart lock on the door, and now they're independent. You put a little bit of camera above it, and now they know who they're letting in, right? So it's just that little switch now has created a little bit more ease, it's made them more comfortable, and it's made them more independent. So if they can access a computer, they can access this technology, they're able to do these things that we don't even think about every day, but who we're letting into our home, right? Or how safe do we feel in our own home environment? 
And so I always like to define what assistive technology is when I'm talking to folks, just so we all know. Um, and this is the Assistive Technology Act. And you know, it's defining AT as devices that are able to improve the functionality of persons with disabilities. And then it goes on to say that they can be purchased or customized, and it gives some examples, right? Scooters, canes, power wheelchairs, manual wheelchairs, patient lifts, and on and on. Really what this definition is telling me is that assistive technology is the use of the de a device or tool to help facilitate independence. And so you have some typical assistive technologies that you might think of in a healthcare space, like a wheelchair, like a cane. Um, technically, glasses are a form of assistive technology because if you need them to see, that's helping facilitate that independence. But then if we start to think about now even just some of the newer technology, like I just gave the examples of the smart home technology, that's in form of assistive technology. It's giving them independence in their home. Um, using a smart, an adapted smartphone, that's giving them independence to communicate to their caregivers or their friends or you know, make a dinner date, who knows? But you're giving them that level of independence. So how are we using these everyday tools to help facilitate independence? And who can benefit? I mean, really anybody with a disability. They could be physically impaired, they can have cognitive impairments, any kind of sensory disorder, impairment. It doesn't really matter. Just somebody who would benefit from some kind of device or tool to help them become more independent. Really, that could be any of us. I mean, I'm wearing contacts right now. I'm benefiting from assistive technology. And so when you think about assistive technology and computer access, you know, the computer, and really now tablets these days, can be used by individuals of all abilities with the right adaptations. You can use these items for social interactions, for leisure tasks. You can use it to communicate, to make phone calls, to um, FaceTime, to have face-to-face -face conversations with individuals, to set up appointments, to you know, get in co contact with your doctor, any kind of work-related tasks, any participation in schooling. And so your disability should not be limited by the access. If you can find the right access, you can do what the rest of us can do, what anybody can do, what we don't think about. And when you're thinking about your typical alternative access for a computer, or really for any technology, you always want to think about, for the individual, what can they do? You don't want to focus on somebody and say, well, that person can't walk, or that person can't move. You're not focusing on what they can do, can't do. You're focusing on what they can do. And so if all they can do is move one finger, then set everything up to be controlled with their one finger. If all they can do is move their eyes, then put everything for eye gaze, right? So what we have here, this is just voice recognition software, Dragon Naturally Speaking. I don't know if anybody's heard of it. I'm sure we have. Also, Google Docs now even has voice typing in there. Just a way, so if all they can do is you know, control their, with their voice, they have a nice, strong voice, then have that be the access method. You have an individual that can only move their eyes. Well, you can get an infrared camera, and you can have that infrared camera put on your computer can be put on a Surface tablet, anything with a USB port, and they can do ev control their entire environment with just their eyes. This is a picture of a head mouse, and there's lots of different options for head mice right now, but let's say your person can only move their head. This is an infrared camera that tracks the head movement. And depending on how they move their head, they move the cursor. But then, so you give this access to somebody, and now they can program and code. Now they can get a job. They can work from home. They can go into the office, whatever works for them. Um, or I have another picture of the other individual at the end who's using a joystick that can be controlled with your mouth. And so they can move the joystick with their mouth, and then by sipping and puffing with their mouth, they can do left click, they can do right click. Again, completely controlling their computer, completely doing whatever they want to do. And now, even with the maker movement, we'll talk about it a little bit, there's an organization called Makers Making Change that is doing build-outs of this, where they have an open source version of what they call LimpSync, where they're, they're giving these to individuals, because these devices are not cheap, and these devices are not covered by insurance. So both of the items you see up here are $1,000. But now that the maker movement has really kind of enmeshed themselves in the AT world, they're doing the build-outs. I think it costs about $200 to do a LimpSync kit and put it together. So. That's really great that all these things are happening where it's more accessible. It's, everything's becoming more mainstream. It's not that different anymore. And the nice thing about that, mm -hmm. Makers Become Change, please. what's their parent organization again? Um, um, Neil Squire. Neil Squire invented the first sip and puff. So they're like full circle now back to like uh, 
distributing it out to the public. Yeah. So that's kind of nice. And they're really great. If you ever look their stuff up, they have, um, if you're Canadian, they're nice. They're, well, they're really nice. They're Canadian. <laughs> yeah, right? Um, but if you ever look on Thingiverse, they have some really great prints for adapted um, key fobs, for ways to carry bags. I mean, they're really, they're bringing it at its basic level, but little things that make it make it independent. I've actually printed the bag holder for a bunch of patients. They love it. It just makes it so much easier to go food shopping for them. So um, if you can make the mouse more accessible, again, I mean, these are, yes, these are alternative access. These are mice. But even something as simple as using like a trackball mouse or a joystick mouse, it gives somebody the independence that they need to meet their goals. With keyboards, you can add software. Just using an on-screen keyboard can make the world of difference. So you have that person that's doing a head mouse. You have that person who's doing eye gaze. This is how they're typing. You have someone who becomes fatigued when they're trying to type a lot of letters. Maybe they're dyslexic or have word finding issues. Then you can add what's called word prediction, where words are getting predicted. So I know our phones all have that now. Um, and it's not like autocorrect where it's really annoying and it's going to replace for you but it's giving them choices that they can select off of the list. And depending on the program you use, they can hear it. So if processing is an issue, they're not sure what's on the list, they can hear it um, and make the correct choice. And these are very small examples of the tons of stuff that is out there to really help facilitate independence. Different hardware, different types of keyboards, different layouts where you can change the print size, you can change ABC from QWERTY. All these things can be done and then, you know, again, that environmental control, that smart home technology. This is really, I would say, one of the biggest changes over the couple, past couple of years that I've seen is just the inclusion of smart home technology for these folks. It really has made such a difference in independence. I mean, I've had literally had patients that can only move one toe, and we've had their entire home being controlled by a switch under their one toe. So it really, it's been amazing. And then again, for your, we do see a lot of individuals that have communication impairments that are either nonverbal or their speech is so slurred that they can't be understood. And years ago, before the iPad existed, you would have to try and go through insurance to get these ten to sixteen thousand dollar devices that were super heavy and kind of hard to transport and never really did what they wanted to do, and people never wanted to use them because they felt it stigmatized them. But now you can get the right communication app, put it on an iPad, put it on an Android phone, and it's really not as big of a deal anymore. Everyone's carrying this stuff around. So you're just adding an app to adapt to their needs so that they can go to the doctor and say, I have pain in my shoulder, or they can go to their family members and have dinner and talk about the weather. I actually um, have seen quite a few college professors and lecturers over the years that have ended up with speech impairments for a number of reasons, and we've saved lectures on their iPads so that it can speak for them, they can still work, they can still communicate. And so it's sometimes, though, when you're looking at your typical assistive technology, what is available off the shelf will not meet the needs of the individual with disability. All this stuff's great, but you're always going to have the individual that it's not perfect, that needs the one off. And so that's when you need fabrication and modification to meet the individual needs. And sometimes low tech is the perfect solution, too. Not everything has to be high tech. But that's where you're looking at that. How can we modify these things to make life a little bit easier for them? And so something as simple as making a dowel so somebody can press the button on the elevator in their apartment. This, I've done this a lot, and it, people love it. It doesn't mean they don't need an aid. It doesn't mean that somebody's not going to help them with things. But just being able to choose the floor to go down, it helps make them feel more confident in themselves and how they're doing their day. The picture on the right um, was something I was doing at work one day. I had an individual that had a pain disorder and couldn't touch a hard fat, um, objects, couldn't use a mouse. So using a makey-makey and some conductive fabric, we made a fabric mouse. And so down the line, it became a lot prettier. Um, it didn't look like this. And he ended up being most comfortable in standing, so he would safety pin it to his pants and then he would have his hand on his side and that would be his mouth. So we were able to just quickly fabricate a, a fabric mouse for him so that he was able to, he was a, a programmer, so he could be independent at work and have an adaptation to meet his needs. Um, this is the project that uh, I fell down the assistive tech rabbit hole with. So this is the second version of ramps. Uh, the first one was a lot bigger, but uh, when I was doing the developing assistive technology class where I met Holly, uh, 
my team, we met a young guy over at um, Rusk. Yeah. NYU Rusk, uh, the rehab center. And Didn't he call himself G Money? E Money. E Money. E Money. Sorry. So E Money was an 18 year old from Brazil. Uh, we went over to kind of get his shoe, figure out how to get his shoe over his splint, which was at a right angle. But we ended up noticing that he was, uh, while he had uh, cerebral palsy, he also had really good propulsion skills, and he was really uh, suave and flirting with all the nurses. And every nurse, every nurse and therapist had a rap that he wrote for them. And we're like, well, why don't we kind of combine his interest in music with his propulsion skills? And so, Ramps is a wheelchair DJ system, and you ride up onto the rollers, and we can uh, detect the speed and the direction of each wheel. Um, this one also has some force sensors underneath, so there's some use you can use for uh, uh, trunk support, trunk balance, um, or you can have another interaction mode with that. So the left wheel would fade and the right wheel would scratch, um, uh, but you could also hook it up and make games like very much tank-like games, right? Um, and it was this kind of, um, it took the assistive tech thing and made it kind of look like, maybe this isn't the orthopedic stuff we're thinking about, but more like the self-expression stuff. And um, so it was, it was a really great project. Uh, the second version here was designed by uh, Vlodek Koss, who in his former life, he was a carpenter, uh, and he worked over at Cooper Union. And, um, uh, but it, just, it would fold up, and um, it would fit into a shelf at, at the hospital. Um, if you notice, next to the wheel, on the edge of the wood, there's a little, um, uh, there's a bearing sticking up. And we had to put the bearings on. We didn't realize this, but there's not a single floor in New York City that's level. <laughs> and so as you're propelling, your, your chair just starts going off to the side. So we had to put bearings on. That was the one kind of like New York uh, feature we had to add in. Um, this was built with like a rotary encoder. Uh, this is pre-Arduino, so we used a pick. Um, and we used like some uh, just basic libraries we found. Um, so all this came back around um, when uh, I was a researcher at NYU and, and uh, I would bring my class over to see Holly and we would, you know, at the end we would kind of have conversations about like, well, what should we work on next? Um, and uh, we ended up meeting uh, a person who then kind of, uh, kind of inspired us to make more and we, DIY ability for people with disabilities. And so uh, electronics fabrication, you know, home automation, stuff like that. Um, also, healthcare professionals. Um, do you want to talk about healthcare? Yeah. Do you know anything about healthcare professionals? I don't know much about healthcare. Okay. Um, <laughs> so, especially from OTs, I think what always drew me into being an occupational therapist forever and a day ago was the creativity. There's always, OTs were always making stuff. I mean, if you look at the history of the profession, they were extending shoehorns so guys coming back from war that couldn't bend down could get their foot in the shoe or making little reachers to pick things up, you know, the things you see on the infomercials in the middle of the night. OTs use them all the time to help pick clothes up off the floor and stuff. And so, you know, why can't we help teach these individuals to make things for their patients? Why can't the, the healthcare professionals be the makers? Um, so we don't want, I, we didn't want OTs, physical therapists, speech pathologists, anybody who's interested to have to seek everybody, us out or other people like us to make stuff, but why not teach them to make it themselves? Why not teach them and enable them to take the everyday items in their clinic and adapt it so that it would benefit their, their individuals that they're working with? Yeah, and a lot of this comes from like, if, you, if you've been to Maker Fair or if you've been to any of the Make events, it's kind of like there's a population that goes there and it's kind of, uh, homogenized, yes. and um, you don't see a lot of people with disabilities there. You don't see many occupational therapists there, or or nurses, or anyone that kind of has, like has really practical needs during the day during their job. Um, but all of the stuff that they have on show there and that they're selling could totally be used um, in different ways. And so it's it's kind of this. What we noticed early on was that uh, of one thing, no one was really talking about it or doing it. There was a few people scattered around. Um, uh, but it wasn't, a, it, wasn't, it wasn't part of the actual community that the maker movement was kind of pushing. And so we were hoping to kind of uh, uh, break into that. And if you look at the curriculum of what these healthcare professionals are getting in college, nobody's getting this stuff. You know, when I went to OT school, we did learn how to, I mean, we learned how to make a loom, for gosh sakes. But this was a long time, I mean, yeah, it's I know. Really old. It was old. It was a long time ago. Um, <laughs> 
And they don't even do that anymore, but we did learn how to craft. Crafting was like a big thing in OT back then, but they don't even do that anymore. So you're really not doing much with your hands to adapt. So why don't we bring it back and teach them how to do it? Teach family and caregivers how to do it. Um, one big event we have every year, we do toy hackings, where we teach anybody who wants to come, OT, PT, parents, you know, whoever, family members, teach them how to take a regular off-the-shelf toy put a switch port on it so you can plug a switch into it. Because if you were to go look at adaptive, switch adapted toys today, I was doing this yesterday at work to show somebody. One toy that we found online was $140 for one peekaboo bear that would hold something up in front of its eyes and so say peekaboo baby. So maybe we should baby. stop. When we I'll say switch. Yes, yeah, sorry. Uh, very much like a momentary switch that you would use in, in physical computing. Um, but it could be a big plastic button that can take really a lot of abuse and hits. Mm -hmm or it could be a super fine whisker switch that the smallest movement can trigger it. It's basically just two wires uh, that end up coming out of a, a three and a half millimeter uh, mono jack. Uh, basically the one you would plug into your old phones that had that. Mm -hmm. um, and that's the standard switch that everyone's been using for 30 years. Yeah, years. oh totally. And uh, it's basically two wires touching. And so what we do is we teach them how to adapt the toy so you can put a switch into it. You can use your head, your feet. Um, and so then any we child can play. And then we show them how to make their own switches, with, uh, which we'll show you some examples later. But that. thinking about it, costs about 3 to $4 to adapt a toy. But if you're going to buy it, it's 140 yeah. And so why aren't we teaching individuals to make the toys themselves for their kids? Right. So these are siblings right here. So um, this is Jackie and her brothers. Um, and they made a couple uh, remote control cars. Not for her. She's, she's older than them. But... She wanted them to come and try it out. We had the biggest uh, toy that people like is the remote control whoopee cushion. Mm -hmm. um, and basically, if you're a nonverbal kid living in a hospital for many months, uh, you can have someone put that whoopee cushion in the nurse's station, and then you can go across the hall with your switch, and then you can trigger it when the nurses come by. <laughs> and so, if you're just imagine like telling jokes when you're nonverbal, and you also have other physical disabilities, it's a tricky tricky task. So electronic whoopee cushions, $12 on Amazon, uh, make the job really um, easy. All right, so we have a, we have a space uh, that's, uh, has anyone heard of the Adaptive Design Association? Uh, so it's up on 36th Street. Um, they do a lot of uh, seating and positioning devices made out of tri-walled cardboard and, and plywood um, for kids that need uh, seatings for school. Um, but they had a lot of space there, and we, we were friendly with them for a while. And the idea was that we'll get some tools in here, we'll make it semi-accessible as we can, um, and we'll just have some events to bring people in, let them learn about the tools, let them go home and figure out which questions are kind of like sticking with them, um, and then hopefully create a, a sense of community around that. Um, so there's things like, what do you do to make an accessible uh, space? Um, it's interesting is your shop probably has to deal with some of this anyway because you're a, you know, you're a public school in a way. And um, so some of the things you might see in your shops might just be standard that were put in there. Um, uh, I don't know if you have adjustable benches down there, workbenches. Some places have adjustable, like just like desks, but you can also have adjustable like uh, workbenches. So um, restrooms, can you get into this every space that you need to? Is a CNC machine in a room with a small doorway, stuff like that. Um, so yeah, we, we've kind of talked about this. Uh, it's bring them there, teach them how to hack, have them think about assistive technology, accessibility, uh, make it inclusive. So uh, there's a bunch of people that we f are inspired by. Uh, and this isn't, um, I, I, I forgot a few other people. Um, but Adaptive Design, who I've mentioned, um, Maker Nurse is uh, our friends Jose and Anna. And Maker Nurse, they kind of do it, what we do for OTs, but they do it for nurses. And they actually have maker spaces set up in several hospitals. Um, for some reason, the University of Texas is super open to this. Their legal team is like okay with everything. <laughs> um, the biggest thing with getting a maker space anywhere near a hospital, the legal team comes in right away and says no. Um, or the doctors say no. Um, uh, but the uh, University of Texas uh, Galveston has a uh, f the makerspace might be about this size for the nurses, uh, this room. Um, and then the University of Texas, I think, has a, a, a veterinarian school, <laughs> and they have a makerspace, <laughs> uh, which is fantastic. Um, 
Uh, Merle Epler, um, she's done some work on, um, uh, I don't think she's there at Annenberg anymore, but she uh, had a book out about communication devices and how the voices of those devices will project the, you know, all the personality of a person. It's it really a deep, interesting um, sociology of like what our communication device is actually doing. If, if you give uh, a young Latino boy a white voice, what does that do, you know, if that's the one that can, they, they can afford? So there is companies in Europe that actually make different um, dialects and, and accents. Uh, go Baby Go, and then Amy and Sean. Um, all right. So uh, one of the events we had was kind of funded by this uh, Cognizant. Cognizant. And um, they, they let us, uh, they gave us some money for some tools. And one of the tools we bought was a, a shop bot. Um, and you guys have played with your CNCs here at all? Or not yet? Yes? OK. Yeah. So, um, so this is Matthew. Matthew, at this point, I think he was 15 then when we took this photograph. Um, he's a, a complete computer nerd. Uh, he'll have his Windows laptop and his iPad. And he won't do anything until you give him the Wi-Fi password. And then <laughs> once he's online, he's, he's good to go. And so he wanted to make an iPad holder. So we looked up the specs. Uh, we've made the tightest fitting iPad holder design. We probably should have given it a little bit more clearance. We didn't think ahead. Um, but Matthew made the vector. And then he brought the vector into the, the CNC software to kind of tool it, path it. And um, he could control the, you know, the machine operation from his uh, computer while I put the wood onto the machine, right? So Matthew goes to the Ability School in Long Island, and he, he, you know, they don't have shop class up there because all the kids have physical disabilities. Um, but it's like, well, why not? Because the CNC machine totally works. Um, the 3D printer just works. And he's, he can use a computer. And so it's this, there's this other barrier that we have to get past of like, well, they're still disabled, so they shouldn't be around spinning router bits and stuff. But um, uh, he, you know, we, we made something in about, you know, 30 minutes. Um, and he also wants to become a programmer because he wants to learn how to automate his house his own way, which I think is um, great. Here's a close-up of one of the toy hacks. Um, really, it's like, get a toy from Dwayne Reed, uh, take it apart, and then try to find the two wires that if you touch them together, uh, we can put another switch onto that to make those things trigger the toy. Um, there's a lot of community there. There's like, uh, this is, um, these are actually board members, I think, of the adaptive design. But um, this is kind of, what, you know, one person will be really scared of doing it, and the other person will just like, just give it to me, I'll do it. And then uh, they kind of work together, and they figure out how to, to get the, the toy adapted. Um, <laughs> This was a, we were... Um, Are they sisters? I never No, it. I no? don't think okay. so. We were actually at an event in New Jersey called EdCamp STEAM, or STEM, where um, they were teaching teachers about accessibility and design and all these things. And so we were teaching them how to hack a toy, but then when it comes down to making a switch, you know, a lot of people don't realize it is just two wires or two pieces of conductive material that touch that close the circuit and make whatever happen. And so we were wrapping aluminum foil around their hands and using alligator clips and clipping it together. And so every time they high five, they were the switch and they were making the bear Bears sing and hugs, dance. I think they were hugging bears. Yeah, yeah, it was something, something yeah. wacky. But again, it was just it was such a great illustration of how does the switch work and how simple it is to just adapt something. So then think about your two kids in therapy that you want them to participate. And you're trying to think of a fun activity. Wrap their hands in aluminum foil, and every time they high five or do something, now the game is going, or whatever it is. I put this slide. Yeah, cool. So <laughs> go, baby, go. <laughs> you, we didn't probably see this slide. Um, so go, baby, go. You know, this is a project that came out of the University of Delaware. And if you ever Google it, you'll see there's lots of different hospitals and centers around the country that are doing these hacks now. And so you're buying these big cars off of Amazon that kids in the suburbs drive up and down their driveway all the time, right? Um, and, but if you have a kid, if you're a little kid and you're disabled, not only can you not drive these, but often they're not even putting you in a power wheelchair yet. And so if you're not in a power wheelchair, you cannot explore your environment. And if you can't explore your environment, it affects your development. So 
What Go Baby Do Go does is it takes the car, it frames it out so that if they have trunk instabilities or any other challenges, they're upright and positioned well. And then it's like a big old toy. So just like we do with the toy hacking, you're just hacking this, adding a switch, that big red thing on the steering wheel, that's the switch. So your kid with a disability, um, I think we did this for a little girl, cerebral palsy, where she would extend out with her movements. And so all she had to do is extend her arms out and then she could drive. And so she actually had brothers that she lived with, and the mom was really motivated to have them all be able to play together, but she wasn't mobile, and the brothers were. And so the mom wanted her to be able to roam around the environment. Yeah. So. It doesn't turn. It just goes. Um, <laughs> but but if, you, if you lock the wheels in a circle, you can have them go around in a circle. But the idea is that these little kids, if they don't get the ability to explore their world, a lot of developmental processes of a child at that age just are, don't, don't start um, flowering. And so you can imagine how frustrating it is for a parent that they see their kid wanting to get moving, but insurance won't pay for a chair until they're four. It's just, it's awful. Um, so Cole Galloway was in the, you know, it's the, the physical therapy department there. Mm -hmm. um, he's also done some interesting projects like rack systems with pulleys and um, harnesses to get people who have uh, walking uh, disabilities to be able to move around their homes. Um, but this is a great, simple, I mean, it's like, it's like the car's cost plus an extra $30. Does anyone know what the orange thing is? Pool noodle. <laughs> yeah, so that's like $2 at Kmart. Um, and PVC pipe and some wires. Um, the, so th they have, this is the thing that like uh, high school STEM departments really like doing. It, like they like to show how like, um, good they are. And so, you know, it's fine. Um, but the one thing that's kind of missing from this is that um, not every kid wants the PVC layout like this um, or, or would need a PVC layout like this for a framing. And so Adaptive Design, who we share space with, they've done some really wacky uh, custom designs. They take, they take about two or three weeks to build it out, whereas this is kind of usually put together in like an hour or two um, in a gymnasium somewhere. Um, but if you want something really custom that completely fits the person's um, like just sitting ability, um, adaptive design does some interesting things. So we got into this program, uh, um, in New York City Economic Development, um, and uh, we got some time and some a little bit of cash to kind of work on this project we had done years ago um, called uh, Capacita. It was an accessible video game controller. The idea with uh, the accessible video game controller, which we'll talk about soon, is um, if you've played a PS3 or an Xbox, you have the controller, it's got 13 buttons or so and some joysticks. You do need two hands most of the time to control that. Um, even with one hand not available, it's difficult to play. Um, the person that we were working with had muscular dystrophy, um, and he basically had, um, he used a head mouse um, to control his cursor, and then he had one finger. That One finger yeah. that could do a fiber optic switch mm -hmm. for left click, right click. So oh, the, his chair that Holly hooked him up with was uh, his finger could drive the chair, but it could also switch modes and become a Bluetooth mouse. Yeah. Isn't that yeah. cool? <laughs> um, so anyway, the, uh, uh, what we did is we made a controller that could be switch accessible and computer uh, controlled to control the consoles. Um, because what we needed was something that was not really, at the time when we were building it, it didn't exist. And we wanted something that could just be, you know, uh, anyone could kind of put an interface on top of it, APIs for any of the programmers out there. Um, and then uh, it would control the consoles, um, um, uh, which, uh, Xbox or PS3. And so what we had with that, just, I mean, just to kind of talk about this for a second too. So what we did is the controller that we built out um, would interface with the gaming system. And so it'll, and it was kind of a go-between with the laptop. And so if they could access their computer, they could then play the game. And the, a look, a visual of the controller would come up. And so for some of these games, you have to hit multiple buttons. Like the fighting games, you have to hit three buttons at a time, right? So even, I don't know if anybody's seen the new Xbox um, adaptive controller that's come out. And that has 16 different switch ports along the back. But again, if they want to play some of these games, they have to have 
a lot of switches plugged in and mounted at all different areas. And if they want to do some of these moves, they have to hit three or four of these switches at the same time. And so we had made an overlay um, that you would see, much like an on-screen keyboard. Oh, that slide. I know, sorry. I don't know what happened to oh, it. Oh, well, sorry, um, guys. There was a screenshot of the interface. And it yeah. was just like, it was the buttons that you would see, the icons on the buttons. But you could drag them and put them all over the yeah. page. You could have multiples of the same buttons all over the page. So that you could almost create like macros of for yeah. certain games and certain layouts. And so if you needed to hit four buttons at the same time to kick somebody in the head, he just would have to roll his pointer over that and then it would do the move. Right. The grouping and the yeah. Grouping and the individual that we actually the original idea came from was as my as um John said had muscular dystrophy. So when you have muscular dystrophy, when you're a little kid, you don't really have too many issues going on. And then as you age, you become more and more impaired. The life expectancy of a male with Duchenne's muscular dystrophy is about 25 to 30. And by the time it's the end of their lifespan, they're on a ventilator, they really don't have any movement, um, they're pretty impaired. They're in power wheelchairs. And so for this young man, he lived in a high-rise apartment building. He had a brother who was like a year younger than him. When he was a little boy, he would play with all these little boys in the apartment, in the, in the building. And then, as, and he, they would play video games, they would run around, they would do everything. As he got older, he lost function. And so he became more of a passive participant where he was watching everybody play. And so when I met him, all he wanted to do was play video games with these kids. This is all he wanted to do. And so it became, it became our, our project, almost our mission, to get him to play. And what was one of the best things about it was that when we were doing the final setup, we didn't ask his mom to come in, we didn't ask his dad to come in, we asked his brother to come in. And his brother learned how to do all the settings because his brother was the one he was gonna be playing with. And so that was important too. So his brother became involved in the training, his brother really understood how the controller worked. And we sent him home on like a Thursday, and then Friday happened, and you know, it was a weekend. And then I checked my email on Monday, and there's this long involved email from the brother giving us feedback, telling us what he thought, and I think the last line was like, and I think he's kicking my butt in every game now, right? Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if you remember yeah. the email. It was something along those lines. And so, and then the gentleman we made it for, he started to go into the code and under the hood and adapt it for himself, and that's really where it came into play that yes, these individuals who were helping make the technology for need to be involved in the design. They need to be involved in the implementation because they're the one, they're the end users. They're the ones who are gonna tell us how to make it better. We can come up with ideas, but in the end, I'm not the one using it at night. And so it really, it became such an integral part of his life. We, we used to, we had another person we gave it to and we could go into the analytics and see what he was doing. And I think we knew when he ate lunch and when he ate dinner, because it was the only half hour of the day that buttons weren't being fired from his game controller. So, you know, I mean, it really, but, you know, I, I, there's an, an organization out there called Able Gamers, and their, um, their thing is helping individuals with disabilities game and looking at all these different adaptive ways. And they had a statement, I'm going to paraphrase, on their website that essentially said, for somebody with a disability when they game, in that environment they can run, in that environment they can jump, in that environment they can do all these things, and if they're playing against somebody in California, that person doesn't know how impaired they are, they don't know anything. The playing field is even across the board. So you know, for gamers, it's a big deal. Get them back in their environment and let them participate just as every other gamer does. And so again, it's how are we doing the design? How are we adapting it for their function and their, for their independence? And, in a medical space, it might not seem that important because it's not a healthcare thing. Like, who cares if they can game? But it's a quality of life thing, right? How do they feel about themselves? You know, how are they spending their time? Life is more than just asking for water, right? It's how else can they become more independent and, and really be more satisfied with their life roles? So the other one thing about the game controller was, so there's, you see the little red, um, there's a Bluetooth uh, dongle in there. Um, from SparkFun, and the idea is that you can connect to this computer with a protocol, um, and you can control the controller from whatever interface, if you're gonna use processing, or if you're gonna use Unity, or whatever, you can control the controller that talks to the consoles. Um, so the thought was, and we haven't really, I, I'm, we're still trying to figure out the right way to move on this, but can you use a video game controller to teach people how to program, or at least gauge their interest in what programming can do for them? And so if you think about programming as like, I can control my home automation, um, and my lights, and my stereo, but if you get them actually like building something that's a, the tool that they'll use for themselves, like their own gaming interface, um, 
it, it kind of like gets their feet wet with programming. And it's kind of like everyone probably learns to program through example code, right? Like you, you, you borrow someone else's code, you tweak it, you see what happens. Um, it's just kind of like you, if you can make that spark, you know. Um, so the idea that this isn't just a, a device to kind of like play video games, but it, could this be a way to a tool for people to get into programming to think about like how you think it control program like uh, their world. So with that, um, there's another project more recently called uh, Blind Arduino, um, and I worked with Josh Mealy and Chancy Fleet. Chancy is over at the library here on 20th and 6th, the uh, print disabled and uh, Braille library, and Josh is over in San Fr or he's in Berkeley at uh, Smith Kettlewell, um, and both of them are blind. And they're both really interested in learning to program, especially they want to learn how to program the Arduino. Um, and so with them, we kind of got together um, some basic specs on how they could teach themselves how to use the Arduino. And <laughs> the, the URL is there. It's very clear. Blarble.blogspot.com <laughs> is a blind Arduino blog. Um, and it is exactly a blog that um, a blind person would set up because it's just text. It's lots of text about how to set up the interface, the IDE, um, the programming pins. And so uh, here's Josh and Chansey's hands. They're, uh, they're wiring up uh, the Grove Shield, which I'll talk about in a second. The Grove Shield has these plugs, these jacks on it that can only get plugged in one way. And so if you have a servo motor from um, Seed Studios, or if you have a uh, switch or an LED, they'll all have this four pin plug that can only get plugged in one way onto this shield that sits on top of an Arduino. Um, so it's very tactile, that's the main thing. Um, here is someone using their braille display to read back the code and then they're programming with their braille display as well. Um, so the braille display just becomes a USB keyboard and a, a kind of like it, it can, anything the screen reader outputs will go through the braille uh, device. Um, but they can also control, like, they can control the uh, text that goes into the Arduino IDE. Um, here's the Grove Shields close-up in the kit. Um, there's like, there's proximity sensors, there's a piezo buzzer, there's a momentary switch, a potentiometer, um, there's a relay in there. And you can see how they just, they have, uh, there's uh, jumper cables in the top part of the photo, and you would basically connect the component into the shield and then each of those shields has a pin that maps to one of the Arduino pins. So uh, they've taken off on it. They went to a, uh, Josh and Chancey went to a blind summer camp in Tennessee, I think, last, this, this summer. Um, and they had about 30 or 40 uh, blind teenagers programming with Arduinos there. Um, and the idea is that, you know, again, these kids were never exposed to it at school, um, but it's, the, the Arduinos are what, like 20, 25 bucks, and then the shield kit is about, Seed Studio, by the way, the cheapest electrical comp electronic components out there. Um, this whole thing costs like 20 bucks, I think. Um, and they have, you know, they have components that could be the Wi-Fi uh, or Bluetooth that can connect into this. So I think we're gonna wrap up on the slides here. Um, we didn't talk much about the first ideas going wrong. No, we've had a couple that didn't really work out as well, but yeah. you know, I think that you know you have to. It's all a lot of trial and error sometimes, and even when we're looking at off-the-shelf technology, what we try the first time might not be the perfect fit. But you want to really just, you know, be creative and be flexible in what your thinking is, and just kind of roll with it because you will come up with the right solution at some point. Yeah. Oh, and then API all the things. So the idea that the switch jack um, that plugs into an, uh, an accessible toy is a three and a half millimeter mono jack. That's standard across all switch devices, even for the wheelchair devices that are switch uh, controlled. Mm -hmm. um, to the uh, Internet of Things, the power switches, to um, um, uh, Alexa has an API, right? Google Home has an API. Um, the video game controller that we have has a serial communication, it's a protocol. Um, but the idea is that if you, bring, if you build your things with APIs, you can then snap your interfaces onto it, but you're not locking that interface to the product itself, right? So anyone could bring their own interface to it. And so you can imagine in the, in the future, like kitchen appliances just broadcast Bluetooth APIs or uh, BLE um, APIs, and then whatever interface that person needs in the kitchen to talk to their crock pot or to their oven, um, it, it can just uh, be accessible. So maybe it's switch scanning or maybe it's a voiceover screen reader accessible. 
And then um, uh, the biggest thing about assistive technology design when you're working with people with disabilities um, is to just uh, use what they have. Like, you're not there to tell them what they can't do. You're there to kind of build off of what they can do. So with the video game controller, he could control his computer with his mouse, uh, his head, and he had his finger switches so he could control the mouse. Um, so instead of us adapting a physical controller with big buttons that he would have to kind of figure out how to work, he was already using the computer, so why don't we just use the computer? And so he could already do that, so let's take that as an extension of what he can do. Another thing I'd also like to add, just in terms of when you're trying to come up with your solution or you're thinking about your design, is low tech does have a place. Not everything has to be high tech. Sometimes that can make the world of difference. There's a lot of moldable material out there. I use this stuff called Sugru. I don't know, I'm sure some people have used it. Um, Instamorph. I use these things to make grips, to make things easier to texturize things. And that's sometimes all an individual needs in terms of what to, to adapt whatever it is for them to make it more independent. Um, you know, I, I always like to give this example of years ago when I was first doing assistive technology. I had this gentleman come in, he was a lawyer, he was, had a spinal cord injury, he broke his neck when he was 19 and he was probably 50 years old when he was coming to see me and he would use his computer with a stick in his mouth and he had his keyboard mounted up here and he would use his stick and he would type and he was a trial lawyer like he was fully working he was completely independent as he could be um, but this is how he used his computer and the reason he was coming to see me is because the mouse stick broke so he came in and he said so I'm here because I want a new mouth stick. And I said, mouth stick? Why are you using a mouth stick? You could do this and you can do that. And I spent like an hour showing him every high tech thing he could possibly do to make it easier to use his computer. And at the end of the whole thing, he said, so do you have a new mouth stick for me? <laughs> right? So, you know, we got to listen to the people we have. We can't discount low tech because for some people, that's what they like. That's what they know. And that's just what works. And so not everything has to be a high tech solution. Yeah. Thanks. I will share the slide link with Rachel so you guys can have the slides. Sorry I didn't put it on the slide itself, but thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. <laughs>